Well, hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Totally Amazing Mushrooms. We've got a great show for you today. We've got some uh, taxonomic history, we've got some edibles, we've got some not edibles. And uh, we've also got some background in there, lab reports. So, come for a walk with us and see what we can see. I've been waiting so long for these guys to come up. These are the shaggy parasols. These guys are in the chlorophyllum genus. And uh, we're going to go through a few steps and uh, break down some parameters so that we can actually get it down to the proper species, if we can. Because there's four that look very similar. Yeah, so in 1835, um, Carlo Vittadini, you've heard that name bench mentioned before, and he put it into the Macrolepiota genus, and they called it uh, Macrolepiota ricodes. So there were three that got lumped into the same. So there was Chlorophyllum olivieri, Chlorophyllum ricodes, and Chlorophyllum bruneum. And th they uh, eventually took it out of the uh, Macrolepiota genus and put them into the Chlorophyllum genus because the, um, they had more similar traits to the Chlorophyllum molybdites and they had less qu similar qualities to the Macrolepiota procera. So they got switched over. But there's uh, still, there's four of them that can look very similar and one is toxic and that is the uh, molybdites, the chlorophyllum molybdites. Now they're not very common around here but they do have a definite characteristics that's very obvious from the other ones. So the other three have um, white spore print and molybdites has a green spore print and quite often when they get to say this size you can start seeing the green starting to form, the color starting to form in the gills. So these guys aren't high in carbs, but they are high in protein, and they're loaded with uh, minerals and vitamins. So these guys have sterols in them, so you know that they're going to be able to make D3 once they get some UV rays. They've got vitamin B, um, and I think it's the B1 and 2, I don't know about the 6. And they've got uh, vitamin A. Plus they have lots of other minerals, they've got copper, they've got potassium, they've got uh, phosphorus very wild. Now one of the things traits about the Lepiotis, and you can see why they put them in the Lepiota, is the Lepiotis quite often have this uh, eye, uh, a radiating eye from in the very center. And the Macro Lepiota is the same. And that one can get confused with these guys as well. However, it does on the stipe, it has kind of a snakeskin kind of a patterny like that. And um, all right, so let's break down the parameters on these guys and try and figure out exactly who it is. All right, so first off, we're going to talk about the Bruneum, which is now classified as toxic. It was not toxic originally. Um, so the Bruneum's bulb, uh, it has that very abrupt. And the Olivieri's uh, has a kind of, it starts to, it starts out slender and then it starts to widen and then it gets another the abrupt bulb as well however the Ricotis does not it just has a slender to slightly bulbous so all three of those have that distinctive double layer ring you know the Bruneum the Olivieri and the Ricotis but the Macrolepiota procera does not but they only have a single layered ring and this one is a kind of a two layers to it it's really really neat so we've kind of gotten rid of the molybdites. So that one's kind of off the, off the chart there. And this one also does not have the green. It's got a couple of bugs going in there. but. And uh, again, they've got a white spore print. So you're not going to see that greenish color on the gills. And like I said, they're not very, very common around here, the molybdites. But they have been, uh, I, I believe they have had one documentation of them finding one in Washington, which is not very far away. So you can see that the gills are free, they're not attached. Now one thing with the Olivieris is they're kind of shade lovers, and they're usually kind of drabby, kind of gray, like olive kind of color, kind of like this one. And the Ricotis can have more um, white exposed underneath the scales. So the Bruneum are kind of more brown, and they have larger scales, and they're kind of more raised, for the most part. And uh, like the Ricotis, you're going to see uh, quite a bit more 
white underneath the scales. Olivieri is this more like I say that uh, olivey drab kind of color. So that's another thing. Now the Olivieri also um, they can have in a very abrupt um, bulb as well just like the Bruneum and this guy has kind of that. The other thing is is the Ricotis quite often will like uh, grassy meadows and whatnot. And like I said, whereas the Olivieri's kind of like being off into the shade, like right here where we're at right now. Yeah, so these guys are beauties, and we're going to be taking some of these home with us. And oh, and when you uh, cut them, uh, you can actually see this where I've actually damaged the gills a little bit. They kind of turn a pinky orange, and that's another trait of them. Once you cut them, you're going to see that you're going to see all this pinky orange. So... I believe we have narrowed it down to Chlorophyllum olivieri. And here's a lovely little one that's just starting to break its veil and leave its little ring. Prime. Just an absolute prime specimen. So see how these guys turn this kind of orangey pink when you cut them? Quite beautiful. Little telltale sign. It's so good. So tasty. Oh, this is awesome. Hey, we're coming up on some Lactarius. I was wondering when these guys were going to come out. All right, well, we have to do some narrowing down on these ones, too, because there's many different parameters. Some of its color, some of its taste, some of it's by the looks of the latex that leaks out of them. And yes, the Lactarius leaks a latex. Sometimes white, sometimes it turns to yellow, sometimes it's kind of like a, a whey, like curds and whey, not the galaxy. And sometimes it'll come out and stain uh, the gills yellow. And then there's different cap colors. And I'm a thinking, I'm a thinking that these guys are part of the candy cap group. Now, are they the true candy caps? We don't know for sure yet until we do all our testing. But here's one thing that we do know for sure. These guys are lactarious. So I damaged the gills there and you can see that white milky latex come out of them. You don't really have to barely even touch the gills and she's going to do that. So, is this the Lactarius rubidus? Is this the Lactarius substriatus? Is this the Lactarius subvisitus? Or is this the Lactarius luciolentus? And there's two different varieties of that one. So, let's do some narrowing down. First of all, subvisitus has a sticky cap. And these guys, it's not sticky. It's not. It's uh, slightly moist, um, but it has just uh, rained over the evening. All right, so that takes subvisitus out of the way. Plus, those guys kind of do get a little bit hot on your tongue. And I've already done a taste test on one of these guys. It did not get hot. It was mild. It did have a slight, slight bitter aftertaste. So those of you who know Lactarius, you probably know where I'm going with this. All right, so since it has the slightly bitter taste, that's going to knock out the uh, Lactarius rubidus. So that one's gone. And that one's the true candy cap, and that one you're going to start smelling like uh, maple syrup or butterscotchy kind of smells. Uh, especially when you're drying, some t drying them, sometimes you can actually smell it when you're out in the forest. All right, is it substriatus? Well, that one takes a minute, but it does get hot. So... Once again, you got to be careful. Also, with the uh, rubidus, the milk that comes out, the, la the latex, is kind of like the whey. It's very thin, like skim milk. And this one's quite like uh, homogenized milk, really. So, now we've got it down to the uh, luciolentus. So, the luciolentus are usually the most bright orange of all of the candy cap group. And you can see that these guys are all pretty orange. Now, the Lactarius latus is the most orange of all of them. However, that one likes about 7,000 feet and higher, for the most part, and it likes uh, having its ectomycorrhizal connection with the Sitka spruce. Now, in 1936, it was described by a Mr. Burlingham, and I believe he's a British mycologist, and he described the Luciolentis, Luciolentis variety as liking dug furs. And well, 
we are surrounded by dug firs and they are the prominent species around here. So that is their ectomycorrhizal connection. So I think we've narrowed it down to the Lactarius luciolentus luciolentus. And they've got, uh, their stipe's going to be kind of an orange and white. And like I said, it's going to, uh, and it's going to have a white spore print. And you can see that uh, the latex hasn't changed color. It hasn't uh, dissipated. It stayed the same. Pretty positive we have the luciolentus luciolentus. Now they've done not testing on these guys in particular. They have done testing on the Piperatus and a couple others. But they were all from Serbia, uh, Romania, one was from India. And so they've done all tests on these uh, different Lactarius around the world. So they found that they had high, high antioxidant properties. And they also have high phenols. And they also found that the Lactarius, the three that they actually did the testing on, was really, really strong in the uh, antimicrobial and the antibiofilm. So that's just amazing. And they were, uh, with the three, they were all in different kind of levels. Um, some were a little bit higher, some were a little bit lower, but they were all pretty much in the same realm. So I'm going to say that the Lactarius, prob this Lactarius probably has the same kind of qualities as what is in the ones in Serbia and India and Turkey and Romania. But yeah, antioxidants, and they've got uh, polysaccharides as well. So they're going to have some anti-cancerous qualities just like a lot of the other ones. Right on. And these guys, I love the flavor. They are in my top seven. And they're probably the seventh in my uh, for the flavor. And I, I just really like them. I can live with that slight bitter aftertaste. It is so slight. It really it, it doesn't change the flavor of your dish at all. It's so good. And they hold their consistency. Like they're quite solid. Solid. And you can also uh, use the stipe. A lot of them, uh, like the chlorophyllum, I just take the cap. But these ones I'll take the stipe too. Unfortunately, I already have a basket that's full of the chlorophyllum. So don't need to grab any of these. So as I was looking for some oyster mushrooms, I ran across this guy, thought it was an oyster mushroom, but it's not. This guy has a real smell to him, and this is actually Tyromyces chionius. And um, in 1835, Elias Fries put it into the Poliparous genus, because back then, just like uh, any of the guild mushrooms went into the Agaricus genus, any of the polypores went into the Poliparous genus. And then it stayed uh, that name for quite a while until about 1881-ish when Peter Carsten um, put it into the Tyromyces genus. So Tyro means cheese and Myces means fungus and Chionius means snow white. These guys have a smell to them. It's, um, it's very hard to explain. It's a very sweet mushroomy kind of smell but it's crossed with like a like a rancid white cheese. I can't even explain it. I'm not even going to touch these guys because the last time I did, I couldn't get the smell off my hands. It was so bad. Pureled twice and I just could not get rid of it. So it was a pretty amazing. And the little dog's growling at something. So yeah, these are polypores and we're going to see if we can get underneath to uh, get a shot of their polypore surface. So yeah, so I don't have to touch it. Here is the uh, spore surface. As you can see, it's a polypore, and uh, they're they're quite uh, fleshy, quite fleshy and uh, soft. You can actually squeeze these guys and get a couple of droplets of water out of them too. But yeah, so not edible because uh, well, they don't have a distinct flavor, but also <laughs> that smell. There's something about it. It's just funky. So uh, yeah, bizarre. 
Um, oh, uh, they do have, um, they, there's, they haven't done a lot of testing for the uh, nutrients, but they have done testing and they came across a compound that I have not heard of before. So this one actually has a compound in it, which is anti-HIV. That is bizarre, and I know that the world has lost a lot of people from this, uh, same as cancer. And so, if this can help us out in uh, that field, in the medical field of HIV and uh, whatnot, if we can help some people with the mushrooms and fungus, that would be absolutely amazing. Sterium hirsutum, kind of hard to see them amongst the leaves. They hide pretty well. These guys, these are the false turkey tails. Beautiful, look at that. Concentric rings. Beautiful. Yeah, they're uh, crest fungus. They don't have the pore surface. We've uh, went over these guys in another video as well. You know, some mushrooms are very good at hiding. And then there's other ones that try to hide, but they just suck at it. Look at that. Look at these guys. At first I thought they were foliota, um, but they're not. So these are uh, the Jumbo Gems. These are Gymnopolis ventricosis. So back in uh, 1902, Franklin Earl, no relation to Steve, uh, put it into the foliota genus, uh, which is what I'd mentioned before. I thought that that's what they were. Those are the scaly caps. And these guys, I know they don't look big, but wait until I pull one up, and I'm not going to do it yet. Um, so anyways, it stayed uh, as Foliota ventricosa, and then uh, 1969, I think it was, um, this other guy's name, Lexemuel Ray Hessler. So that's, uh, I don't even know if I pronounced that right, but... Yeah, so he was an American mycologist and put it into the Gymnopolis genus. So, these guys have a uh, cinnamon spore print and when their uh, veil breaks, you can uh, see on their ring, they'll, they'll leave a uh, cinnamon brown spore. Um, but I also took one home and did a spore print and they drop masses of spores. It's crazy. Uh, are they edible? They're bitter as sin. And I mean pucker up, buttercup, because it's crazy. Um, they do have in them, they've got uh, alpha and beta glucans. Now what those are, they're just chains of glucose. And uh, the alpha and beta just means that they're the same structure. They've just got different uh, molecules and compounds on different spots on the chain. But the beta glucans in particular... Now, of course, there's going to be a plane flying over top. My apologies. Um, so the beta-glucans in particular, they uh, can alternate their positions of the different glucose molecules. And this actually stimulates our macrophages in our white blood cells uh, to produce more macrophages. And uh, those are the guys that are the big guys that come in like a uh, Pac-Man and gobbly gibbly gobbly gibbly like uh, they'll surround it and gulf it like an amoeba kind of thing so yeah so they've got those but they've also got polysaccharides which are also chains of sugars but they're uh, multiple different kinds of sugars so you've got your uh, glucose is the main one that's always a big one that's on the chain but there's also uh, fructose and mannose and maltose and blah 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 so these guys have got not scaly but kind of a hairy little cap and when I pull one up, just hang on here. These guys are just absolutely beautiful. So I'm gonna have to put this down for a second and I'm gonna pull one up. Here we go. So, I'm just trying to get this position so you can see it. Look at the size of this thing. It's just honking. Sorry, I'm fighting with this uh, Berberis aquifolium here. It's prickling me. Uh, nonetheless, so yeah, beautiful, beautiful colors. Look at that. You can see why they get the dyes out of them. So back to the polysaccharides. Um, those, uh, they stimulate our uh, immune system as well, but they not only do the macrophages, they also do the, they stimulate the neutrophils and the monocytes, which are all white blood cells. 
So yeah, just absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous. And I wish they were edible because they're such a honking specimen. Now they are very fibrous, so they're probably full of fiber. Surprise, surprise. And probably got lots of protein in them. But yeah, just wild, man. Absolutely love them. The colors this year, just amazing. So these guys' uh, caps will start to come up and, and get kind of flatter, and then they'll flare up a little bit, and they're going to dump tons of spores, like these guys really, really dump them. But wow, what a honker. It's like, it's like having a banana. Wow, man. So neat. Don't think I've ever seen one this size. And we've got a woodpecker pecking in the background there, keeping us company. You can actually maybe even see a little bit where the uh, spores have been dropping. Yes, you can actually. So let me reposition. There. You see, I pulled down part of the veil, and you can see this, it's already sporulating there. It's, uh, and that's the color. It's kind of like a cinnamon brown. And of course, there is one more thing too. These smell really sweet, almost like a, an apricot or uh, a peach or something. Just, yeah, it's just. Mm, yeah, it just smells really nice. Unfortunate that, that, that they are not edible. Not toxic, but uh, just way too bitter to try and eat. And not very far away, about a hundred yards away from the jumbos, we have Stropharia ambigua. Look at this little beauty. I'll get us in a little bit closer here. Wow. Yeah, so uh, Stropharia means sword belt or ring and it's called the questionable stropharia reason being is uh, most stropharias have a ring and this one most of the veil gets left on the cap margin and it also gets left on the stipe and you're going to see when i pull this one up and you're going to see a little closer and whatever is left over on the stipe for the, in the ring zone is very, very fragile. So you can pretty much just blow it right off, like a good strong wind or a bit of rain is going to knock it off. Now I'm going to set up the tripod here and I'm going to pull this one up. Just look at this beautiful, beautiful little specimen. So it was originally uh, described and called in the agaricus genus because you can see it has gills and I've got to be very careful because this is so fragile and I'm going to show you in a second what it why so anyways uh, 1898 Charles Norton Peck described it as uh, Hyphaloma ambiguum and uh, Fifteen years later, he and Sanford Zeller got together and renamed it into the Stropharia Ambigua binomial name. And you can see that uh, it could kind of, without the uh, veil litter all over the uh, entire thing except the cap, um, can look very much like the Gemata that we showed in episode 11. Woodpeckers. Oh, I love that. That's the pileated woodpecker you hear. Yeah, so, look at this. Okay, so just watch it. Just barely touch it, and it's already wiped off. You can pretty much, let's see if we can blow it off. <laughs> yeah, it blew all the, the, the more sticky-outy stuffy. That's my new terminology. It's the sticky outy stuffy. Now all the veil remnants, a lot of it came off, but you can just barely run your finger down and you can see where it's come off. Now there haven't been any lab reports done on the Ambigua. It has done, uh, they have done rep, um, tests on different species of Stropharia, but the problem is the I couldn't find any conclusions. So that I saw, read the abstracts, I read the introductions, but no conclusions, no results. So if I do find any, I will update you. 
but yeah, their uh, their stipe's going to be either hollow or it's going to be uh, kind of got this cottony kind of stuff inside. So yeah, but uh, minus uh, the vulva on the gemata and minus uh, all the veil remnants on this beautiful thing, um, you know, they could look very similar. They got a same color cap, almost identical color cap. So I just wanted to bring the whole thing up and show you it's it's mowing down on all this wood debris that's in here. Here you can see the the veil. Uh, some of it's still left behind there, in between the stipe and the margin there, and then part of it's uh, broken off. Now it's going to leave a little tiny bit of a ring in there, but like I said, a good wind or a, a bit of rain it's going to come off. Now these guys, pretty much, most of the time I've ever seen them, is always been in the fall. Um, there is one that looks very similar, uh, but comes up in the spring, and that's uh, Loratiomyces persevalii. And, but it does not have all uh, a, as much remnants on it, and I believe it actually has a uh, clean stipe. But don't quote me on that one. But yeah, it can uh, look very similar to it. Also, these guys are saprotrophic, so they're going to be working on all the uh, litter and uh, needle duff and everything that's underneath. You can see that it's kind of growing in amongst these uh, sticks and everything, so it's chowing down on those. So and here's a nice little cluster. And these guys are uh, Foliota terrestris. Got these beautiful little tiny, tiny scales on them, and they grow in a little clump. They're uh, one of the very few foliotas, if not the only, that will grow on the ground. They'll also grow on uh, like a really, really rotted debris, wood debris as well, which there is most likely underneath here. Lots of it. But again, like the foliotas, like the scala caps there that we did um, the, on episode 11, these guys have a nice uh, brown spore print and again not edible but being foliota they most likely I have not found uh, any information or any lab reports on these guys yet yet um, but they've only <laughs> they've only done testing on uh, what uh, I think 15 or 16 percent of the all the species of mushroom out there so it may be a while before they get to it but we never know but most likely, um, due to the fact that uh, we know what's in the scaly caps, that these guys probably have a lot of the similar traits. But just a beautiful little cluster to look at. And uh, I'm just going to readjust the camera here so we can get underneath. Forest floor, just absolutely lovely. Sorry, I'm kind of upside down and sideways here. I'm hoping I'm getting the shot. So hey, I got a new toy. One of our totally amazing subscribers brought up the fact of the bioluminescence of the Hypholoma fasciculare. And uh, <laughs> so Little and I went out to Canadian Tire this morning and uh, she loves going in there because they allow puppies in there. So went in there and got ourselves a UV light. And we're just coming up on the Hypholoma fasciculare here and this is them under regular light and let's see what they look like under UV well it's it may not be oh there we go that. yeah we've got way more examples too oh this is amazing oh, I wish this was So cool. Yeah, they're just everywhere. And, <laughs> I mean, it's pick. Oh, there we go. Oh, right on. Neat. They're all over. Oh, look at these. Just hiding in amongst the underbrush. Well, maybe
my oh my look at these isn't that beautiful and when it's live it's really amazing thank you so much for bringing up the bioluminescence under UV lights wow you know this uh, it's not doing it justice I can tell you that well, there we go there's the shot Well, I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. Wow. Well, that's another episode of Totally Amazing Mushrooms. Thank you so very much for coming along on our journey with us today. And if you enjoyed what you saw, please hit the like and subscribe button if you're not already subscribed. We got our basket full of goodies, and we're heading home to do some cooking.